I'm getting to open up this final panel, which is about the unreality of memory, um, which I think some of it has been sort of discussed a little and hinted at already today uh, with some of the panels and talking about uh, varying points of perspective and how we can all be staring at the exact same thing and see something slightly different just based on where we're standing. And I think memory is that way also. Um, as a writer, I was just talking with my students a couple of days ago about my biggest fear. We were writing about our biggest fears, and one of mine is that someone else would write my story, right? Like, how terrifying is that? Um, that I said, you know, my, if, if any of you ever write about me, my ghost is gonna come back and say, that is not what happened. I said, so I feel like there's a certain amount of, um, when, we, when we consider memory um, and what's real and what's not, um, I think a lot of that has to do, right, with, with our perspective and how we experience things, right? Um, how we see things, the, the things that we hold. And so I, I have siblings also, right? I have two sisters and a brother, and we're all within five years. And we all, when, when one of us is trying to tell a story, I promise that all of us are gonna tell the story um, and fill in all kinds of blanks. And that's how it is when you live in a big family. Um, so this piece uh, hopefully ties together uh, the other two, um, along with the unreality of memory and the things that get remembered and why and how and by whom. Um, and which stories get preserved. We've been here a long time in this sweet soil soaking. We know the earth, the bounty of our own bodies, how to be the star of stories no one celebrates but us. Lucille Clifton said, come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. And we celebrate the mastery of every moment, the mistakes we managed to survive, the milestones of motherhood and not, the millstones we maneuver turning everything to dust. Of course, we know how to walk directly into chaos and have it sit down somewhere. Of course, we know how to feed ourselves, been growing broad over the earth. We've been nestled against this land long enough to know its language. We sing the terrain and know its name. We've been so close to the earth we were buried, knew plenty about seeds bursting beneath the surface. When you feel the ground tremble, of course, it is us breaking through the ceiling under your feet. We speak mud as first language, fluent in the tongue of the buried. There are a thousand untold stories in every place we've been bound, and we speak them in the language of survivors, in the language of growth, in the language of breaking the crust that would confine us, say, you know how my hips have never forgotten the drum. You know the way my voice sounds like a conjured grandmother. You know how I write poems like invocations. You know how my spirit never sleeps, how we laugh at our own temporary blood. And oh, sweet Lord, how we laugh, how buckets of glass leap from our heads, thrown back and open, how we spill sharp, choking out the swallowed stingers. How we dance until our feet blister and open, knowing the stains will tell the story of our movement. We, super magic, we, beloved, immortal, even our echoes got knuckles. Listen, in the canyons, over the ocean crashing, our ancestors stay chanting. We in here, we still here, we been here, we survived, we survived, we survived. Thank you. Thank you everyone for staying for the last panel of the day. I hope we will hear some things that just kind of bring everything all together and then have a great opportunity for conversation. I'm Mindy Besaw. I'm one of the curators here at Crystal Bridges. And this morning we really started with Neri Ward and Neri Ward re-examining a historic text in We the People. Text, as we've seen, words in art have carried us through the afternoon, and it's going to continue even in this session. In particular, this session will think about history and memory, memory as history, history as memory, and I think, Susie, that was a great introduction to this. We'll start by Erica Doss giving a little 20-minute set us up for conversation. Then we'll hear from Sandow Burke and Michael Waugh, and then we'll open it up for conversation. So thank you. Erica, all yours. Thanks, Mindy. Can you all hear me? All right. 
and I want to thank the museum, and I want to thank all of you for sticking, it, uh, sticking around. It is gorgeous outside. <laughs> I'll just stop right there. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. Okay. I am delighted to be here this afternoon and to introduce the artist featured in this third and final panel, Sandow Burke and Michael Waugh. Their, their art, and in particular, their work here in the museum, and I hope you get a chance to see it, uh, Burke's Monument to the Constitution of the United States. This is a 2012 print from an edition of 25, and Waugh's Decline and Fall, selected readings from volumes one, two, and three, which is an ink on mylar triptych dating to 2009. These especially resonate with this theme of memory and by extension, contemporary ideas about history and American identity. Today, the words memory and history are often used interchangeably, um, a confounding of previously separated categories that stems from shifting understandings of how meaning making works or behaves on experiential and emotional terms. What we know, in other words, strongly relates to what we've experienced and how we feel. And those felt memories constitute both self and national forms of identity for so many Americans. Both of these huge works, for example, embody the sustained, critically engaged interest of their makers in big, epic, mega issues and subjects that have been central to American understandings of self-definition and national purpose literally since the nation's founding. Burke's focus is on the representation and meaning of the US Constitution, the supreme law of the United States of America, officially ratified in 1785 with a preamble that opens with the words, we the people, and advocates the making of a more perfect union. Backed by seven government-defining articles and 10 amendments collectively called the Bill of Rights, the US Constitution has been amended 27 times over the past 228 years, testimony to the intended flexibility of this foundational document in a nation state that was itself predicated on the flexible dynamics of dissent freedom, self-interest, and unceasing change, both good and bad. The print in the Crystal Bridges collection, which features the entire text of this nation-founding document and includes room for future amendments, is Burke's debut entry in a series of imaginary monuments that he's been crafting since 2007 fanciful memorials to the historical documents, the treaties, the speeches, the proclamations that have shaped and directed the nation's actions and ideologies over the past two centuries. From the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which the US signed in 1948, to his proposal for a monument to the prison industrial complex uh, from 2015, which addresses head on the facts of contemporary incarceration in a nation that mocks its much lauded trope of freedom by imprisoning more of its citizens than any other country on the planet. Mike Waugh's equally ambitious scope is the representation and meaning of the trajectory of Western civilization, no small subject, in direct reference to an appropriation of select passages from three of the six volumes that the English scholar and historian Edward Gibbon published from 1776 to 1789, the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And I want you to raise your hand if anybody in this room has actually read, I don't know, a, a paragraph, a volume, <laughs> history, decline and fall. Edward Gibbon, thank you, thank you, all right. <laughs> Featuring images of what appear to be North American mammals, the black or brown bear, the gray wolf, each panel corresponds to Imperial Rome's demise, according to Gibbon's text, and further correlates to an American scene context. The first panel, for instance, 
depicting a huge bear clutching a savagely mauled deer in some North American woods, directly references Gibbon's discussion of the excesses of imperial Rome, its greedy conquest, sadistic violence, overall debauchery, think Caligula. Direct reference is the appropriate term here. The images we see are based on Waugh's concentrated use of Gibbon's text, his words, hand-drawn in various patterns and sizes and with varying amounts of ink, a practice known as micrography or microcalligraphy. Waugh deviates from micrography's traditional use on religious terms to expressive and highly personal gestures that reference his politics and his sexual identity with, as critic Calvin Reed remarks, wonderfully visual, queer-directed wit. Whoops. Decline and Fall's second panel, for example, depicts a smaller bear hugging himself in a ravaged environment of clear-cut forest and piles of rock. This burned-over landscape looks, to me at least, like the consequences of industrial logging in the Pacific Northwest. While the second volume of Gibbon's history details the sack of Rome by Visigoth hordes, this silly, sated expression on this bear's face and the blatantly phallic log between his legs suggest a different interpretation of Gibbon's narrative of imperial decline and fall. Likewise, the third panel featuring a lone wolf growling over a dead fawn, both references Gibbon's third volume account of the bloodshed of the medieval Christian Crusades and foreshadows Italy's imperial futurity in the growling form of Mussolini, who enshrined the wolf as an official symbol during the 1920s and 1930s of hyper-masculine modern age fascism. A massive undertaking some 1.5 million words and 8,000 footnotes, cover, this is why no, none of us have read this thing, <laughs> covering 1,300 years and three continents, Gibbon started his historical project at the tender age of 27. As he later recalled, it was at Rome on the 15th of October, 1764, as I sat musing amidst the ruins of the capital while the barefooted friars were singing vespers in the Temple of Jupiter, that the idea of writing the decline and fall of the city first started in my mind. His thesis that Rome's imperial decline was due to the triumph of barbarism and religion following political infighting, bad senators, ruling class squander, does any of this sound familiar? The rise of outsider influence, notably Christianity, struck an emotional chord in the late 18th and early 19th centuries when newly formed republics like the United States were struggling to gain traction. Indeed, Gibbon's obsession with decline and fall was a particularly modern obsession. It was driven less by the facts of imperial Rome's degeneration, which was more a process of socio-political transformation than one of total apocalyptic ruin, than by early modern anxieties about labor, race, gender, technology, in the new economics of capitalist and nation-state competition. Not surprisingly, from George Washington, whose copy of Decline and Fall we see on the left, to Breitbart, which we see on the right, this has been a popular source of anxiety, American anxiety in particular, ever since Decline and Fall. And that includes American art. Thomas Cole repeatedly painted his anxieties about the survival of this new American republic and the lack of national morality from his five canvas series, The Course of Empire, which he said, quote, anticipated the downfall of pure Republican government to Crystal Bridges pictures like these. Thomas Cole, like Edward Gibbon, was both profoundly pessimistic about democratic politics and deeply persuaded by a cyclical understanding of history, 
in which empires and nations evolve, decline, and fall. He extended this narrative fate to Native Americans, doomed to perish in a dim pre-modern past, and you can see a Native American figure standing on the left, and he also extended it to simple shepherds, sentimentalized in pious pastoral allegories about some time long ago, which is what we see on the right. As per the symposium's focus on the intersections of contemporary and historical pieces in the Crystal Bridges collection, and particularly in terms of memory and history, um, Mike's decline and fall can be contextualized by any number of works. Animals figure in more than a few examples from the collection, uh, including John James Audubon's dramatic documentation of indigenous American creatures, like the cross fox and the wild cat, examples that we see here. I'm also reminded of Catlin and Tate's depiction of indigenous beast, buffaloes and grizzlies that Euro-American pioneers and settlers insisted on controlling containing, killing. Dogs, animals that Americans treat as companions, as friends, as sidekicks, are represented in the collection by these paintings, by Susan Waters and Andrew Wyeth. And bears become stand-in for children's stories, the wonderful Three Bears by Paul Manship, and also for religious self-identity. Benjamin Kopman, whose work we see on the left, founded the Jewish Art Center in New York in 1925 and wrote about the defining attachment of Jewish faith and the modern art of Jewish painters in a 1928 article. This was the same year that he painted this self-portrait. This is part of the Stieglitz collection, which is shared by Crystal Bridges and also by Fisk University. Now, if these and other images and objects were typically deployed in American art to mediate human-animal relationships, they don't project the same big picture take on American memory and American history as these pieces by Burke and Waugh. Their work, rather, is both monumental in size, uh, composed of nine sheets of paper, monument to the Constitution of the United States measures 48 by 63 inches, and the three panels of decline and fall measure five feet nine inches by three and a half feet. These are really big pieces. They're also monumental in terms of narrative ambition. Each plums the art and the words of the past to craft new ways of thinking about both. As Waugh remarks, the text and images I choose and the relationships between the two are the conceptual heart of my work. Burke is similarly driven by literary and visual tropes, <clears throat> asking, what if we made history paintings now? He reimagined Emmanuel Leutz's iconic 1951 or 1851 painting of George Washington crossing the Delaware, which we see on the right at the Met. He reimagined it on explicitly modern terms in his 1990 canvas North Swell, showing California surfers in the throes of both a past and a present history. Note the terrific similarities between George Washington's grim visage on the right, and this is a drawing uh, by Leutze here in the museum, and Burke's picture of the similarly stern-faced leader in a wetsuit on the left. These prints, these drawings, are part of his imaginary monument series, and these include his proposal for a monument to the Miranda warning on the left, and they're all similarly engaged in this, what if we make history painting today? His monumental print to the US Constitution, I think can be contextualized by several memorials in the museum's collection, such as Karachi's bust of Alexander Hamilton, and Clark Mill's tabletop sized bronze of Andrew Jackson. And these are both typical of statue mania directives that valorized great American men in order to establish what historian Benedict Anderson called the affective bonds of nationalism. Burke's project similarly corresponds to William Birch's Country Seats of the United States, 
a collection of valorizing pictures of great American buildings, including the US Capitol, seen here under construction. Uh, note the workers in the foreground standing around with boxes and crates of construction materials and under the symbolic control of a gigantic eagle overhead clutching the new nation's official seal. Normative national ideas about honor and valor are, as Burke remarks, just the starting points for his imaginary monuments, which have their base in spoof, satire, and social critique. He shares his monumental sense of irony with another California artist, Sam Durant, whose installation of massacre memorials commemorating those killed during the Indian Wars between European settlers and Native Americans forms the basis for what we see here, um, an installation uh, which is at the LA County Museum of Art, um, and it's part of his proposal to relocate and transpose 30 of the original monuments to the National Mall between the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Monument. That would really stir things up. Burke notes that he was formerly inspired by Durer's monumental woodcut, The Triumphal Arch of Maximilian, Maximilian I, which is a gigantic composite image printed on 36 sheets of paper from 195 separate woodblocks. Um, and here we see on the right its display at the National Gallery. But Burke's snarkier, snarkier, more critically informed consideration of memorials and monumentality can be traced to an earlier American art history of politically engaged printmaking, including these lithographs by Reginald Marsh um, and Harry Gottlieb, both of which are in the museum's collection. Depicting unemployed men collapsed and depressed around the base of Henry Kirk Brown's animated statue of George Washington, Marsh calls out the inequities of modern capitalism during the Great Depression. Gottlieb, a leftist who worked in the graphic arts division of the WPA's Federal Arts Division and Arts Project, uses his print to beseech Lady Liberty, the nation's most symbolic female, to do the right thing and receive those huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Like these American artists, Burke critiques the symbolic capital of monuments and memorials, the manner in which they speak to and perpetuate shared values and shared concerns. The big sweep of his big print also recalls, I think, this 19th century engraving. Like George Caleb Bingham, Burke is invested in the American vernacular, in the ways that democratic governance does and does not work. He conceived Monument to the US Constitution while on fellowship at the Smithsonian and spending, as he put it, two months being a tourist and doing all the stuff you do in Washington, like visiting the rotunda for the Charters of Freedom at the National Archives. What struck me, he recalls, was the whole tourist world of DC was presented like it was 1776 with people dressed up in tricorn hats and ringing bells. But the people in the buildings are making decisions that are affecting my life right now. It's not 1776. I had just seen the Constitution, and there are all these people talking about the Constitution. I started thinking about these texts you take for granted and you never really read. His project began then with reading those texts and then mapping their contemporary relevance, often on highly sardonic terms, as in these details from the left side of the piece, which illustrate the various houses of government, including fast food restaurants. <laughs> like Waugh, Burke prompts us to ask what we find memorable in America. What do we choose to remember in America today? How do our memories constitute our histories, our identities, our sense of ourselves, our sense of ourselves as Americans? Why have so few of us actually read, or recently read, the originating documents that shaped and continue to define the nation? Why do we fear or ignore or take for granted our Republican origins? 
like Mark Tanzi, whose provocative 1994 painting Landscape, which is titled Colossi on the reverse, which is also in the Crystal Bridges collection, both of these artists recognize that the processual terms of memory are fraught. Tanzi's, quote, pyramid of testosterone-fueled history, um, as one critic put it, is a mountain littered with broken and crumbling memorials to great men, from Egyptian pharaohs and Julius Caesar to Constantine, Lincoln, Lenin, Hitler, Stalin, and it evokes the fleeting and devastating terms of empire. This picture's vast wasteland and its crimson hues qualify this sense of ruinous consequences. However, postmodern, Tansy's aesthetic anxieties about history and memory are consistent throughout American art, from Thomas Cole's melancholy 19th century landscapes to contemporary ruin porn photography. Decline and fall narratives persist. Importantly, Burke and Waugh both, I think, challenge Tansy's spectacular and cynical view of history if also sharing his conceptual and intellectual interest in allegory and big picture meditations. They are less ambivalent about memory, about history, about art, and in fact demonstrate an emotional commitment toward their projects that is especially evident in terms of labor and duration. It's difficult to comprehend just how much work time, effort, and physical exertion goes into making these drawings, but both Burke and Waugh are committed to marathon-like bouts of aesthetic labor. What I'm concerned with is labor, Waugh remarks, and especially the relationship of the labor of working people to capital. Artist labor is not that different in the larger sense, except that artist work is fetishized to the point of aestheticization. Their carefully conceived and composed work challenges the quick sound bite, or sight bite in this case, challenges the sensationalized glitz and bling of much contemporary art, demanding our attention to and our engagement with the issues, the concerns that continue to preoccupy many Americans. What we choose to remember and how our memories and histories define us as a people and a nation. Thank you. Hi. Wow, it's interesting to sit here and have people talk about me. <laughs> she did the job for me. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. I, I, I live in Los Angeles. I've been hoping to get to Crystal Bridges for many years, and here I am. So I'm glad to be here, and thanks for bringing me out. Uh, I was going to give an introduction to my work, which now is not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm an artist in Los Angeles, and I have sort of uh, accidentally d stumbled into this way of working where I get uh, I tend to get a tiny idea that grows to epic proportions, sort of out of control, um, over and over again, it seems to happen. Uh, uh, most recently, I just completed a nine-year-long project to create an illuminated manuscript of the entire Quran in, and transcribe the text in English and illuminate every page with scenes of life in the United States. Um, this is... a. Uh, one of the spreads and it, using the, the formats of traditional historic Qurans and all the text in English transcribed and using sort of the formats of uh, historical Quran uh, borders and little palmettes which mark the ends of verses and the numbering of the verses in the, in the margins. But then all the scenes are life in the United States today that are metaphorically tied to the text in the Quran in this case to a passage about the flood of Noah's Ark, um, going along with the image of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. Or scenes of catastrophe uh, that go along with the stories of um, God's, God's wrath sort of coming down onto the earth and 
uh, how he's destroyed ancient civilizations, which is a sign to us today that the Quran is a true message because we can see the remnants of civilizations that had come before. The Quran uh, also frequently talks about the idea that it's a message coming down from the sky and it's coming to all humanity and it is spread across the word as, this, as a message and so much of my imagery is about the ways that um, messages get spread in the world today, in this case through graffiti. And another scene that, again, that talks about the way that we can believe the Quran is real is that we can see the evidence of things that have come before us that has been um, wiped out by God. But this was a project that I began uh, thinking it would take me a couple years and it ended up taking me nine years, as often happens with projects that I undertake. Uh, Fortunately, uh, after about three years, I was invited to be an artist in residence at the Smithsonian Institution. And I went, as she said, for two months and wandered around as a tourist. And like she said, I was struck by the way that uh, all DC is presented as this uh, 1776 tourist zone and the decisions going on inside the IRS building in this case are affecting us every day. And that led me to actually pick up a copy of the Constitution uh, and read it after I had seen it in the archives and remember that I probably hadn't read it since high school and, and then it just led me to the idea that everyone should read it and so I started creating this monument uh, with the idea that it would contain the entire text of the Constitution and all the amendments and they would be legible and then the scenes around them show how they actually affect our daily lives today the Bill of Rights in the center. Um, and uh, sort of interspersed with while I was working on the Quran, I started doing other imaginary monuments. The second one I did was the United uh, Nations Declaration of Human Rights. And again, it was with the idea that you could look at the drawing and you could read the entire thing, every single word. Um, and that the power of the words themselves would then you know, strike you more, and then you'd put it together with this uh, image. In this case, it shows a sort of toppling monument that's barely being held up, and it's surrounded by uh, sort of a conglomeration of world cities and from all the different continents. And the project, uh, now that I've finished the Quran project, which was so all-encompassing and so exhausting. Uh, I've found this, these um, imaginary monuments to be really fun to do because I sort of get an idea and I can investigate them and I can come up with an image and I can work on them and sort of within a whole month it could be finished and that's really a relief to me <laughs> working sort of quickly. Uh, in this case this is a imaginary monument to the letter that Christopher Columbus wrote when he discovered the new world uh, and it's the actual text of the letter in which he basically is saying to the queen, I found it, it's amazing, send more ships. <laughs> uh, I've carried on this project, I've done about 25 now, but they've sort of evolved instead of um, all showing all the entire text of, of a document. Uh, this is a monument to the Defense of Marriage Act and gay marriage, and it's now become sort of a pyramid in which every level uh, shows through history all the different laws that prohibited people from marrying each other, starting with the pilgrims who couldn't marry the Indians, and then when people couldn't marry black people, and on and on, and it builds all the way up to the top. This is a, a monument to the establishment of the national parks, imagining as if it was carved into the side of Half Dome Mountain in Yosemite, <laughs> sort of like uh, <laughs> Mount Rushmore. Uh, it's, you know, Mount Rushmore, they blasted away the mountain to create this monument, and now to us nowadays, that just seems like a horrific violence against nature. This is a, a similar, it's called Rediscovering the Temple of Equal Rights, and it begins at the bottom with workers uncovering the foundations of the earliest uh, speeches given for women's, uh, women's right to vote and then it goes up the pyramid with all the attempts for women to get the right to vote. Um, 
and going all the way up to the very top uh, when the, the Equal Rights Amendment was failed to be passed. This is a monument to the Riot Act, uh, beginning with the, its foundation in English law and then going on to the American version of the Riot Act, which gives the, the president permission to call out the troops in emergencies. And then tacked on it are all these sort of billboards which show all the time periods that it's actually been enforced, uh, mostly in the South during the civil rights. This is the Miranda warning with the foundation in the Magna Carta. And then each level is a Supreme Court cases in the United States which have gradually given more and more rights to the individual up until the Miranda warning. This is a, a monument to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the Mexican-American War. And I imagine it as being a monument that would be set in the middle of the Rio Grande River between the, the two countries. And the foundation is a pile of rocks that are all inscribed by the names of the native tribes that inhabited the region before the Europeans came. And then the next level is uh, the flag of Spain, which, which ruled the territory. And then the next level is the Mexican um, level when they controlled it. And then the shape of the monument is, is a map of all the territory that the United States took from Mexico after the war surrounded by a border fence and a sign that says welcome to the United States in a very unwelcoming way. <laughs> and if you can actually read the text, you can find the, the paragraph in there where the United States says that we feel so bad about taking half the country of Mexico that we're gonna give them $15 million. <laughs> <laughs> this is a monument to the NYPD where the foundation is uh, the ruins of the World Trade Towers, and it's all piled up with flowers in that those years after 9-11 when everyone was in love with the NYPD and the firemen, and they were the world's greatest heroes. And it's sort of topped by the more recent uh, NYPD stop and frisk problems and the choking people. And so they're sort of crushing their own reputation by their own actions. And to the prison industrial complex, which is especially relevant in California where we have the three strikes law. And you can see how it just, once the three strikes law is passed, it just mushrooms into this enormous structure. And then all the text is the gradual reduction uh, of Supreme Court cases in California, which have gradually forced the government to let more and more people out of jail. And this is an imaginary campus of monuments to all the wars of the United States, starting in 1776. And uh, there's different wing for every uh, of the, all of the continents of the world that we have invaded and bombed and attacked. And uh, in the 240 years of the United States, there's only been 22 years when we're not fighting against somebody for some reason. So that's what I brought. Hi, I would, like everybody else, like to thank Crystal Bridges for bringing me here. I've wanted to come and have had a wonderful time so far. Um, in the topic of memory, let's see if my presentation will make sense. Um, is this the George Washington you know? The George Washington you remember? Or is this? They look like very different people. This George Washington is very much the George Washington of the 18th century. Notice how the fashion gives him wide hips, narrow shoulders. He's got a powdered face. Also the artist, no brow ridge, rounded chin, small nose, rosebud lips. This is very different from what we think of as George Washington, where his jaw has been squared off, his shoulders are broad, his nose is large, and brow ridge. 
He is masculine. And one of the, the things that was very controversial about the decline and fall of the Roman Empire was Gibbon's contention that Christianity feminized the Romans and weakened their empire and contributed to the decline. And uh, I would contend that Gibbon's focus on that had much more to do with this transition from the 18th to the 19th century to his own times and the concerns of those times. And the first volume was published in 1776, so it's a very important moment for our country. And if you think of how gender and femininity was demonized um, by a song like Yankee Doodle Dandy, uh, which basically is uh, talking about the macaron, which is this dandy that came back from Europe with big wigs, powdered face, dramatic mannerisms, leading to the downfall of Europe. Anyway, this is a good way to rally the people who are never going to be able to vote in the United States to go to war. Demonize the feminine and move on to the masculine. Get rid of the Europeans. Uh, in my piece here, the central bear is very feminine. And I contrast this with this masculine grizzly, mouthful of teeth, although he is gaping in horror as he looks on at this very fey bear in the center who's hugging himself. Um, now, I think as far as memory goes, there's the kind of macro memory of history, which I was talking about with the ideas of femininity being demonized to rally the troops in the revolution. Um, but my, my work in that it engages with historical documents and historical images can sometimes appear to be impersonal. Although if you get up close to it and see that it's all writing, it's obviously very much my hand is there and it's making. But certainly in this piece, I was very invested in my own history of growing up in the 70s where you had long-haired men, peace, uh, Leif Garrett with blow-dried hair, and then the extreme reaction of the Reagan era against that, and uh, I'd say culminating in 86 with California putting on its ballot, uh, Proposition 64, I think it was, which would have mandated that all gay men be tested for HIV, and if tested positive, um, sorry, getting emotional, put in concentration camps. Um, so that kind of emotion is what I build into this piece um, with the hypermasculine bear. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I wanted to move on to a more current piece. And I was commissioned to do a piece for a public school in Brooklyn. And I thought back to my own high school times, which were very difficult, as you can <laughs> tell I'm getting choked up. Um, and I was very happy to be able to make work for middle school kids. And this is a detail from one of the murals I did in a new public school in Dumbo. Um, and you see this little chickadee is quite flaming in violet. Uh, I've added color to my work, which I, I see as an additional way to queer the content. 
Uh, here you see the, the full mural at the entrance to the school. It's about 25 feet long. And you've got uh, male and female parents overlooking their chicks. But two of the chicks are kind of straying from the pack, including the one that's the, the flaming violet chick. Um, I'll show you all of the, the pieces and then tell you what the texts are. As you go up the stairs in the school, there is an eagle which is flying down the stairs. And I, I wanted to make a formal connection with this eagle kind of vibrant and trailing these flaming colors to back to that, that chickadee that's straying from the pack. So there's this kind of visual link between the two. Um, deep within the school is a third piece, which is a pair of pheasants. Here's a detail of that. So let me go back and say, this was a very controversial building in New York. The neighborhood did not want it. Uh, and it was rejected at first. And then the developer added a school, sweetened the pot, and it was accepted. So I wanted to address that history of the building and that controversy of it. But how do you do this in a public work? How do you do this in a way that's veiled enough so that it will get by the censors? Um, so that people won't be offended by that. Uh, and one way was to present, uh, all of my work has a surface level and a deeper level. Hopefully people can just go by and like the, the kind of cleverness of text as image but there, there are many things going on. So I promoted this work by saying that this piece is about family. <laughs> <laughs> this piece is about freedom. This piece is about luxury. This piece is made up out of text from the School Construction Authority of New York City, their capital plan for five years, which included the building of this school. The developer had to submit an environmental impact report for the building. This is the developer's environmental impact report. So there's a very, much, a very clear connection between the developer and the School Construction Authority. Now, of course, they are about family and freedom, but it's about the freedom of a uh, kind of capitalist raider in this case. Um, I had wanted to make the third piece about the community, and I collected letters from people in the community opposing the, the school, but I couldn't find a way to use those letters without being snarky towards those people because there's always this critical relationship between the text and the image. So this piece is somewhat separate from the others, although I used the architecture of the building to build in the meaning. The female pheasant who's oriented towards this area of the building, uh, this is the entrance to the school library. So the female pheasant is oriented towards the library, but she's looking back at the male you know, what the heck are you doing? He is walking into the cafeteria. <laughs> <laughs> and the text here is a USDA school nutrition study. So you've got the kind of combination of the, the written word and the meal plan of the school. So I wanted to try and keep this short. Um, so I'm essentially done. I just wanted to point out a kind of neat thing, which is in this uh, image of the 
eagle that's diving down to get the little chickadees. Uh, you've got this area of devastation underneath the eagle. And I used the same source material as is in the middle panel of my piece that's here in the museum. Um, so you'll notice the same kind of trees and clouds. Uh, I often recycle images like that and build up a connection from one piece to the next. Thanks. Well, I'm, thank you all for that. And happily, we actually have a good deal of time to have a good discussion. I know I have many places that we could start, but because you ended with being able to use text almost subversively by including it into um, your work with the school, and I know when you all spend time with both um, Sandow and Michael's work in the gallery, it's interesting to watch people take time. So there are a few things that I think we can talk about, and I'll try not to mix them all up in one question. Um, I wanted to talk about texts both as veiled in there, um, in the work, and you mentioned you really had a purpose of making sure everyone could read each word in the Constitution. And <coughs> opposingly, if you stand in front of your work and try to make out the paragraphs of the rise and fall, you get a little bit frustrated with finding that. Um, so I thought it would be interesting for both of you to just address that quickly, and then we can move on to thinking of memory and um, monuments in history. So um, how does text function in these different ways? Um, well, I think there are many ways that it functions, but I taught English for years. Mm. And of course, as you can imagine, being an English teacher, it's very frustrating when people don't read. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I also, in my work, <laughs> I choose books that people don't read <laughs> and documents that people don't read. So there, there is, in my approach to those texts, a kind of intense melancholy about not reading, uh, especially when, even though these are things people don't read, they're really important. Um, and my goal is not to, like, here, let me make it fun so you'll read it. It's more expressing that melancholy that these are not read, and I'm still not going to let you read it. If you want to read it, go to the library, get it, sit down and read it. You know, uh, you need to do the work. <laughs> Mine would be the opposite. Mine would be, I think you should read this, and you should read it right now. <laughs> and here it is right in front of you. <laughs> so make it easy. And you're going to make it fun. Uh, yeah. And sometimes sad. And sometimes sad. <laughs> yeah. Do you have thoughts on text and memory? Um, no, I like both of the both of these approaches. I'm still probably not going to go read all six volumes of, of <laughs> Gibbon, um, The Decline and Fall. But yeah, I'll feel bad that I didn't do that. Um, <laughs> Good. And, and <laughs> it worked. Um, and I do agree. I think we should read the Constitution and we should read the amendments and we should even know what the Bill of Rights is. But the same with the Miranda warning. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm always amazed um, how we don't know what our rights are. Somebody mentioned this this morning, I think. Mary Ward mentioned this this morning about how few of us actually know what our rights are as Americans when um, we're in certain situations. For example, somebody knocks on your door. What are your rights as a citizen, et cetera? And we should know what those are. Yeah, it's getting harder. They seem to be evolving weekly now. To what, <laughs> right, right. But. Can they look at your phone at the airport and right. all kinds of things? Yeah. Which we don't know the answers to. Right, but I think that it starts with us even understanding what they are now um, and recognizing how they are evolving or changing or being challenged, et cetera. So, yeah. yeah. Well, speaking of evolving, um, how does, and Neri Ward also mentioned this this morning, that when he created We the People, it had one particular meaning. When it was shown in a different context, it had another meaning. And then today, 
has a very different <coughs> meaning. I think about your work, you have a few touch points of 2007 as the residency in which inspired Monument to the US Constitution. Then it was made into a print five years later. And about five years later, we have it on our wall here, and we have a different, we'll call it political climate than we did five years ago. So how does one document, one image, uh, evolve in meaning, context, memory over time? Well, I think, <laughs> you know, as an artist, we make them, and then it, it's sort of beyond our control as time goes on. It's, but I guess, similar to the whole books you're talking about, the rise and fall, and what they meant then, and what they mean now, and what they mean in retrospective. Um, I don't know. I, yeah, times change and the meanings change, but you know, the people standing at the front are saying that the Constitution doesn't change and it should be followed. So, <laughs> uh. when I was coming up in art history, I remember um, being taught about uh, George Caleb Bingham's the the county election, and it was used as a document of democratic governance. We're a little drunk, we're a little rowdy, but we're all out there and voting. Isn't this great? This is democracy. This was a long time ago. Um, and then the decades changed and our consciousnesses were raised and we started going, wait a minute, who's voting? And who's in this picture? And who's not in this picture? And is it really appropriate to bribe people to vote for a particular party? Um, as I said, times change. So <laughs> you're absolutely right. You make the work, but the piece itself changes in the context of American memory, American history. What about monuments? Yep. What are the roles of, you know, you're doing these imaginary monuments. We have not so imaginary monuments everywhere. If you walked from the Bentonville Square here today, maybe you noticed the monument in the middle of the square. Maybe it's become so much part of your everyday life that you don't notice the monument. Um, do we imbue monuments with memories so that we can remember? I know, Erica, you've done a lot of work on this. I just think you have to say a few words. I actually think we make monuments to forget. Um, <clears throat> we, we make monuments and memorials to pay tribute, um, to honor, and then we walk away. And um, in a sense, the foundational documents of the United States are all about this. We made it, and let's, you know, we've got it, and let's walk away from it. But sure, the, the memorial that you have in your, in your downtown here is a pretty good example of that. Um, perhaps from a different era, <clears throat> uh, when people felt differently about certain things. And, okay, great, now you have this thing, and what are we going to do with it um, in a 21st century context? So, um, particularly when people have chosen to, for to ignore, to, to forget, rather, the history that it embodies. So, this is um, a cautionary tale about making memorials, um, as I'm sure your projects are all about, with imaginary monuments. I mean, God forbid we actually make some of these yeah, things. Yeah, and I, I have other ones that, <laughs> that I didn't include, such as a monument to the war in Iraq, which is sort of a crumbling Arc de Triomphe. And so, yeah, I don't ever intend mine to be built. I think it, you can, they can be more ironic that way. Right. Or the, the last piece that you showed with the endless landscape of monuments. Why don't we stop making monuments and ask ourselves questions about why we have so many wars. Yeah, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Um, do you think that there is in memory, and kind of defining memory or looking at history, is there any element of your work, earlier we talked about, is there a call to action? If you're doing an imaginary monument that's not intended to be made, or suggesting a text that you should go read. Is there um, either a call to action or any kind of social critique uh, embodied in your work? Is your call to action go read given? Um, I don't think my call to action is necessarily go read given. I, I think it's more to read carefully, mm. you know, whether it's given or something else, because there are hidden agendas. Um, 
for one thing. You know, I put them in there, <laughs> and Gibbon puts them in there whether he was conscious of it or not. You know, the kinds of concerns of his times end up guiding what he says. So, you know, hopefully it's that reading is interesting, mm -hmm. you know, one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And I think you gave us a hint on your social critique with the feminized and masculinized images that memory, then how, how does that carry on in our minds, especially looking at George Washington. So some of those social critiques and hidden agendas are certainly there with your work as well. Yeah. I, I, mean, I was thinking last night about you know, a movie, Rashomon, and the Rashomon effect of People see the same thing happen, and they will report it vastly differently from one person to the next. So I, I think that that kind of inability to figure out what the agenda is, is always important in my work. And that's one of the ways that hopefully it unfolds, that you'll see it as a neat trick to begin with, and then as a kind of nature motif, and then things unfold, you know, from there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Do you have any calls to action or social critiques? Well, sure. That's the whole point. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah I mean, my monument to the Constitution is imagined, uh, if you look at it, it's, it's not just like an Arc de Triomphe or something, but it's, a, it's an apartment building, and it has people living inside of it, and it has people all around doing things and living their normal lives, so they're all sort of swarming around it. And then at the bottom, there's like an entryway to get inside, and it's like really heavy security that really makes it difficult for you to get inside. So the dueling ideas that the Constitution for, should be for us all, and we should be aware of it every day, but also that it's being used to uh, be inaccessible in a way, I guess. Yeah. Erica, do you have final questions before we open it up to the... Um, I, I thought we could talk for just a minute about issues of labor, um, because I sort of hinted at that at the end, but um, I don't know. I'm, I'm just really impressed with everybody today, all of the artists who participated today, make work that requires time, requires a lot of commitment. Um, in this panel in particular, both of you have talked about labor, labor-intensive, um, how did you get into, either of both of you, um, making work that takes a lot of time? And where did that come from? And where did your work ethic come from? Well, well I know. Uh, you know, I, I went to school to be a painter. And I live in Los Angeles. And throughout my whole career, I've sort of been preoccupied with why am I a painter in Los Angeles in 2016. You know, I live in the city of movies and television, and all my neighbors work in TV, and they go off to, the, to work at the studios and the record industry. Like, everything around me is, like, the 21st century. And it's like, why did I choose this profession to sit alone in a room and paint like people did 700 years ago? And I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't ever have the answer, but I constantly, in all my projects, I sort of think about well, what can I do as an artist that only an artist could do, that couldn't be made as a video or couldn't be a TV show or something? And so part of the appeal of, of making the, the illuminated Quran was to, to make an illuminated manuscript like monks used to do a thousand years ago, all alone in a room, and write every word by hand and paint every page by hand. It's just something that an artist can do that is unique to being an artist in, in the world today still. That's important to me. Um, I think like I was illustrating with my piece, I think I have a macro answer mm -hmm. about labor, which relates to a kind of Marxist perspective. But then there's a, a kind of biographical answer as well, which I think there's a common um, personality trait among people that grow up gay trying to overcompensate and not be rejected. Um, so just being a hyper-perfectionist, overworking, you know, doing more than you would necessarily have to do. And those habits, 
once established, I may as well use them to my advantage. And, you know, yeah, that's smart. <laughs> Wasn't there also a performance that related to this work, the decline and fall? Yeah, at, the, at an art fair in maybe 2009 or 2010, um, one of the days of the art fair, the art fair was open for eight hours. So I stood and read the first panel of the piece, from a book, not from the, the panel, <laughs> um, nonstop for eight hours. Uh, my favorite aspect of that was that I was catheterized, so I wouldn't have to <laughs> leave. Um, and I had my art dealer come and empty the bladder. <laughs> <laughs> hey, labor. <laughs> of, of a different okay, kind. <laughs> so who has questions? <laughs> I'm curious about the American Koran and if it is on display somewhere or if it's going to be printed as a book. It is a book. It you is a book. You get it in bookstores. You really? get it on Amazon. Oh, yeah, cool. it's been out for about a year. Uh, it, it is a t traveling exhibition. It uh, was shown in Newport Beach, California at the Orange County Museum and it, then it went to Jordan Schnitzer Museum in Oregon and now it's going back to California and I think it's going to Boston after that. It's traveling around. It's a big show. It's affordable, right? It's a $65 book. It is. On Amazon, yeah. I think it's yeah. $62. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's highly affordable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just curious what each of you might come up with as an image using a U.S. history textbook. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and you can just contemplate that. That's just an idea. My, my only answer to that is that I have piles of books that I'm interested in, and I have hundreds of images, and it takes me years sometimes to figure out how to put them together. Um, so my approach would be to put that book in the stack. <laughs> and you know, maybe five years from now, I'll have an aha moment, you know, that'll figure out how I can subvert it. I think if you put your imagined monuments together, it may almost form a textbook of sorts. Yeah. Right, and I mean, speaking of history, the role of memory, memory and history and text all together, who is the author of our textbook? How do our textbooks revise and change over time? Um, how is our history reinterpreted? I hope that even these sessions today have helped us maybe reinterpret uh, some of our histories as a plural. Um, so who is included, who is not included? What happens to the environment? You know, all of that is such a variable, I would argue in a history textbook and hopefully in an art history museum, American Art Museum. So, yeah, any other questions? Yeah. Mr. Burke, I saw your um, To Helen Beck in San Jose a few years ago. And um, obviously you're traveling through um, uh, Dante's world as Virgil. Um, how are you Virgil? and the worlds that you're drawing now. I'm so, how am how I, are you Virgil? Are you still Virgil? I saw myself as Dante in that project, actually. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> My mistake. I was the, more the clueless pilgrim. <laughs> well, that's pretty deep to get into something. So do you still see yourself as, as Dante moving through those worlds? Uh, I guess so. It's, yeah. I, could, I mean, I, I, come, I do artworks about things I don't know about. And through the course of making the, the project is how I learn about them as I go, yeah. rather than being the one that already knows and is trying to tell. OK, thank you. Are, are you traveling at all with your book, uh, your translation of the Quran? Uh, 
Uh, two days ago, I was at the Indiana University talking about it. Indiana University, if, if that's what you mean. I'm happy to go anywhere and talk about it. <laughs> yeah. uh, hi guys, my name is Josh Goss. Uh, I'm a scientist. Um, so as not an artist, uh, I found myself kind of captivated by both of your works. Um, it's kind of interesting to have them side by side. Um, so I didn't mean to do this, but uh, last Friday I was at the National Archives and, and I saw the Constitution. Um, and then I saw on Saturday, I was standing in front of your piece, um, and I was really captivated by how over time our Constitution, the, the, a lot of the text is faded, it's almost completely legible. You catch like We the People and then a few letters that were kind of bolded. Um, but you're, you went through, through so great pains to, to write all of the words and make them so legible. And then with your monuments, you've got this kind of historical background. So kind of a follow-up to what Mindy was asking. Um, do you see yourself as a historian? No, I just see myself as a social commentary person. Yeah. And, and you know, the, it, the, at the archives, they're trying to make the Constitution legible, too. They don't want it to fade away any sure, more than sure. it is. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's not intentionally fading away. Right. Yeah. Right. And I have one more question for Michael. Um, your work is, the triptych that you have here is so detailed. How long did it take you to, to complete that? Uh, about 10 months. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, I... Uh, I've had to figure out many ways to rest my body. I have a timer now that I set for 15 minutes so that every 15 minutes I'll do some hand stretches, uh, back stretches. You need a Fitbit. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the Bakelite timer that okay. my father used to oh, have. Right. That's really nice. That's really amazing. Thank you both. Thank you. Is there one more question, or we can actually continue all of these discussions perhaps over a coffee or another kind of beverage of your choice in a reception. But before then, um, we have some final remarks, I know, from Margie Conrads. So we will hop off the stage and turn it over. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>